Hey friends, everybody hear me okay? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let's talk about death. Uh, before we get into it, I just want to issue a content warning. Uh, although the topic of death in and of itself can be quite sensitive, we're going to be talking about some topics like uh, suicide, self-harm, and in one case, uh, child death, which might be specifically sensitive. So just be warned. Whoops. On a much less <laughs> serious note, I'm also going to be talking about death in a bunch of games, including Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy VII, Mass Effect III, Undertale, among others. So if that is super concerning to you, now you know. All right, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Gabby Darienzo. I'm an independent game developer from Toronto, Canada, also known as The Six, home of Drake. Uh, <laughs> uh, and a lot of my work is influenced by and surrounds death. I am the co-founder of Laundry Bear Games. It is a Toronto-based game studio I found with my partner, Andrew Carvalho. And we are currently working on a death-positive video game called Mortuary Simulator. That's my little mortician over there. Uh, it is a, thanks, <laughs> it is a narrative-driven job simulator where you play as a funeral, dire funeral director running a funeral home, and we're working with some really awesome people on this game, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, I'm very interested in the intersection of death in video games, but particularly death positivity in video games. So if you haven't heard of the term death positivity, essentially what it means is, um, well, actually, it's like a relatively new movement that started, and uh, it's encouraging people to be open to talking about and thinking about death. And I've written articles about death positivity in video games for various publications, including Kill Screen and Amaze Magazine. Uh, and I was really interested in hearing about how other, ga other game developers are using death in their games. So I started the Play Dead podcast, uh, where I interview game developers about how they're using death on their, in their games and their thoughts about death and mortality just in general. And something really interesting I've noticed with interviewing game developers of all ages, of all backgrounds, is that death has actually kind of changed quite a lot since the early days of video games. So. Let's talk about, let's do a very, very, very brief <laughs> look at the history of death in video games. So in the early ages of video games, death was really rarely used as the central focus or topic, um, so much as a way to punish and challenge the player to do better. And if it was an arcade game, it was also a way to encourage people to spend more money. Monetization. Uh, at this point in time, life systems were popularized. Uh, life systems meaning a certain amount of retry is designated to a player after they've died. Uh, this also includes health bars, a visual indicator that shows the player how much health they have left. Uh, when the bar runs out, that indicates that the player has died. Uh, some game developers innovated on what this looks like. So when we think about the Legend of Zelda series, instead of using a bar, they used hearts. And as you progress through the game, you get more, you get more heart containers, and that extends your health bar. Um, some games completely innovate on the health bar system altogether by replacing it with something else. So in the Mario series, Super Mario series, uh, they use mushrooms and power-ups and even like outfit changes and height changes to show you the player's progression and the player's health progression. Um, health bars, life systems, and respawning, which is when the player reappears after a fixed point in the game after they die, um, became a pretty large staple in games. And there wasn't really, there was about two or three decades where not a lot changed. The formula didn't change up too much. Though we did see some visual innovations like in Dead Space, they put the health bar directly onto the player as opposed to in the HUD or the heads up display. Um, in Doom, which was the first first person shooter, you had your character's head on the screen and uh, it would show you, it would change based on how much damage you take. Uh, we also saw the introduction of regenerating health in games like Halo Combat Evolved. Um, so in the top, top right hand corner, it's actually not the health, it's the shield that's regenerating, but still. And then something interesting happened. Call of Duty 2 decided to change what health and death look like in video games. Instead of having an arbitrary bar that would move back and forward based on much, how much health you have, what they did is they took that out and replaced it with this red vignette that would start to come in as you take damage. Sometimes there was blood. And the more damage you take, the more opaque it gets, the, the closer it comes in. Sometimes there's like a heartbeat thumping. And uh, this really sent the message to the player that, hey, you're injured, you're going to freaking die. And uh, if you hid or if you got out of the line of fire, you, your vignette would slowly go away, indicating that your health has regenerated. So there's regeneration in that game. And although it can be a bit vague, as it's not like an exact number, it's not like a, you have 2% health left. It's just kind of like, oh, there's a lot of red. Uh, I don't know what this means. Uh, it's, a bit more, it's a lot more immersive than having a bar or a number on your screen. So this was introduced in 2005. And since then, we've seen a huge, huge shift from using a health bar to using damaged vignettes or something similar. 
Uh, now, damage vignettes were a huge innovation on the way we visually depict health in games, but what games have innovated on death from a mechanical perspective? Back in 1980, a game called Rogue introduced the mechanic of permadeath to video games. In the game, your character had to progress through a series of procedurally generated dungeons to get to the end, but if you died, there was no respawning. You just have to replay the game from the beginning. Um, they anticipated that this would piss off a lot of people, but in actuality, it challenged its players to not only do better, but to be careful with their player. And the, the deaths in Rogue meant a lot. And Rogue started a, gen a genre of procedurally generated games with permadeath, which are referred to as roguelikes, or sometimes roguelike-likes, if the game is different enough from, from the original Rogue, but still has some of the same mechanics. Uh, some more recent examples of roguelike-likes are Splunky, Binding of Isaac, and Enter the Gungeon, just to name a, name a few. Uh, and this genre is alive and well. There's a lot of roguelikes and roguelike-likes out there. Uh, Enter the Gungeon actually just came out not that long ago. Uh, other games have used permanent, uh, permanent death to affect gameplay, and Mass Effect is a fantastic example of this. Uh, so in the Mass Effect series, which is currently three main games, currently, <laughs> your party is made up of yourself and two other party members that you can choose from. So you have like a, a whole cast of people you can choose from, but when you're playing, uh, you can only have two at the same time. Um, and it's possible in the game for some of your party members to die. And a lot of these deaths are dependent on the choices you make in the first and second games that carry op over to the third game. So for example, Tally, who's on the right here, uh, there's certain choices you make in the second game that in the third game, if you don't make the choices the correct way in the second game, in the third game, Tally will kill herself and it's super heartbreaking. <laughs> uh, now mechanically, if a party, me party member dies, there are other party members with similar skill sets that can replace them. So it's never gonna break the game if a player dies. But these deaths heavily affect the story and oftentimes the choices the player has to make. And because these choices carry over game to game, you can't just like reload an old save and try to fix it. And probably the most well-known example of permanent death is in Final Fantasy VII. And so uh, in my podcast, one of the things I like to do is I like to ask people if they have a memorable death in a video game. And <laughs> the majority of people say Eris, uh, which makes me really mad. I'm like, think of something different. <laughs> Uh, so in Final Fantasy VII, you have a party, um, and you can swap out who's actively in your party when you battle, up to three people. So it's similar to Mass Effect. Um, and there's this character named Eris, who's also known as Aerith in the Japanese versions, who is the party's only dedicated healer in the game. And midway through Final, Fa Final Fantasy VII, there's a cutscene in which Eris is killed, this cutscene here. And from here on out, Eris is dead. There's no respawning, you can't heal her, she is gone. And this death was not only shocking, but also incredibly important because the whole game you've been using Eris in your party, and there's a good chance you were using Eris in your party because she was designed to be the only designated healer for a reason. Uh, and when she's killed, it's not only affecting the story, but it's, your game is now forever changed. And much like in real life, you now have to cope with losing a person and it's, who's pivotal to your game strategy. So we talked a bit about how games have innovated on death in the past. Um, this isn't, this isn't to say that using traditional death mechanics like health bars and life systems and respawning necessarily a bad thing. I think that it's important to consider that a lot of developers um, are drawing on mechanics that already exist but are not really considering what is best for their game in particular. Uh, but an example of a game that does use traditional death really, really well is Mirror's Edge. So in Mirror's Edge, it's a game about parkouring around these very, very tall buildings <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a game about speed and agility and grace and getting from point A to point B the fastest. And in the game, uh, death usually comes from falling. That's usually how you die. Uh, there's a lot of falling. <laughs> and when you fall, there's this almost too long death. It's like three seconds long. And the screen is shaking. And there's like wind blowing past you. And you can hear the blood rushing to your character's ears. And it's terrifying. And you die and you respawn. So it uses respawning, which is like a traditional death mechanic. But the fact that it uses this like almost too long death is really good. Because in a game about speed and agility and grace, that way too long death just is, challenges you even more to do better and be faster and not die. And you know, when the developers were making this game, they chose like a traditional death mechanic because it fit best. So we looked at the history of how death has been used in game development in the past, uh, but most of these examples have been from AAA developers, not including some of the roguelike likes I mentioned earlier. Um, but something that's really interesting and really awesome is that independent game developers like myself and like you all um, have been innovating on death mechanics um, in more interesting ways now more than ever. <laughs> 
so Caitlin Tremblay talked before me, and she actually talked about this a bit. It was really, really good. Um, but so why are people innovating on things even more? Well, a big part of this might be the increase in accessible tools and accessible learning. Uh, lots of these tools, lots of these ways of learning are free. Anybody can access them. And this allows anybody to learn how to make a game and develop a game. But it also comes from accessible marketplaces like itch.io that are open to everybody. And this creates opportunity for independent developers to share their games easily with less reliance on publishers. Um, who in the past would be, so, <laughs> uh, who in the past would be the main reason or the main way to widely distribute your game and usually had some control over what content you shared? Uh, being able, able to produce and widely distribute games allows independent game developers to create more personal games about their experiences with death and loss and grief. And a very, very good example of this, very recent example of this, is a game called That Dragon Cancer, which was developed by Ryan and Amy Green and based off the true story about the loss of their five-year-old son who had been battling cancer for four years. Uh, if this game had come out 10, 20 years ago, there's a good chance it never would have reached such a wider audience as it did today. It's also really important from a cultural perspective that people are able to put their culture into games. Uh, and a really good example of this is uh, Guacamelee, which was developed by a Toronto game studio called Drinkbox back in 2013. And Guacamelee presents death in a very, very positive, very beautiful way. Uh, and much of that is inspired by Drinkbox concept artist Cuso Keanu. Is, uh, he's from Mexico, and it's inspired by his experience growing up in Mexico and also Mexican, Mexican culture and folklore. So in the game, the player uh, plays as Juan, who is a luchador, who eventually unlocks the ability to switch between the world of the living and the world of the dead. And when you switch between those two worlds, uh, the music becomes this gorgeous, ethereal version of the living world's music. And the, the colors become more vibrant, everything becomes a lot more pretty. And the game features these really friendly like, skeleton NPCs that are supposed to be representative of the deceased. And they're almost more lively and more happy <laughs> than their living, to, living relatives and loved ones that are still alive. Uh, I also had a chance to interview Kusho for my podcast a few months ago, and we talked about Drinkbox Studios' new game, Severed. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this too much because it came out like three days ago, and I want to spoil anything. Um, but something that I was really interested in hearing was how Severed deals with death. Um, so Severed deals around a young woman named Sasha who must exact revenge on these monsters who murdered her family and severed off her arm. And when I was talking to Kusho, he commented that death is often depicted as an evil Maculavellan character in games. So when we think about how death is represented in games, it's usually like the Grim Reaper and it's always a bad guy and he's always like a few. Uh, <laughs> and what made more sense for Severed's story was to personify death as accurately and as positively as possible, which is a true neutral character who can help Sasha grieve and go through her grieving process. Uh, a game that did some really neat things with death, or an independent game that did some really neat, neat things with death was Undertale, which launched, launched last year. And Undertale is an RPG that twists the mechanic of fighting and killing monsters on its head. So in the game, you can choose to fight monsters or find other passive ways of defeating them. But every time that you choose to kill a monster, you're contributing to the death of that monster's race. Uh, it's entirely possible for you to commit genocide and kill off an entire like, race of monsters. Uh, and if you, do, if you choose to do that, NPCs in the game will treat you differently based on if you kill a little or a lot, it doesn't matter. And this is a really interesting twist on a genre that has been around forever and has always encouraged players to kill things without thinking about the repercussions. There are a ton of indie games that do really, really, really cool things with death, and I couldn't, I did not have time to talk about them all. Um, Firewatch is one I thought of as I was like sitting in the audience, like, oh shit, I should have talked about Firewatch. Uh, <laughs> but here are some examples. Um, fun fact: Sunburn, which is in the top left-hand corner, was developed in part by Tony Pizza, who's one of the organizers of Indiecade. It is really, really good. It's super, super good. Okay, so we talked a bit about the history of death in games and how indie developers are innovating on death pre presently. Um, so let's talk about the future of death in video games. <laughs> Specifically, we talk about virtual reality and de how death works in virtual reality. Now, the reason why I want to talk about death in virtual reality is, <laughs> is not really in regards to the future of death in game, or sorry, the reason why I want to talk about death and virtual reality in regards to the future of death in games is not because I think the future of games is solely going to consist of VR games, but rather I think VR is in a stage right now where it's still somewhat new and subsequently developers don't always know how to handle that. Uh, it's much like when 
touch devices came out, iPhones, iPads, and developers didn't quite think of the best way to use this tech and instead were relying on old mechanics and trying to force it into these things. So whenever time, any, any time that developer put like a joystick and buttons on an iPad game, <laughs> it, you know, it didn't really feel like they were thinking about the tool and how to best use it. And this is really, really similar to VR. When we think about, you know, you have this headset on, you're looking around, and you're like, oh, the graphics are amazing. It's like, I'm really there. The technology, the future. Then it's like, OK, now look down at your controller and press B. And it just takes you, <laughs> just takes you out of that world. And the same thing goes for death. I've, been play I've played a lot of VR games uh, that deal with death. And it's always like, there's this static bar on the top left of your screen, no matter where you look. Or it's like, oh, you died. Game over. Press X to start again. And it's so. <laughs> It's just very, very arbitrary. Um, and this immersive new medium, the immersive new medium of VR, really requires us to think how players interface with it and how we can use death. Now, one example I can think that does this really, really well is Eve Valkyrie, which is a uh, virtual reality spin-off of the MMO Eve Online. Uh, in the game, you're playing as a space fighter pilot and must navigate your ship, protect your fleet's vessels, and destroy enemy ships. Uh, but the player's deaths are super, super cool. <laughs> I was trying to find a video, but it was really long, so I didn't include it. So here's a screenshot. Uh, so when you die, your screen, and this is all in VR, so you get to look around and stuff. When you die, your, does your screen smashes open, and you're in space, so ice just immediately starts like covering your uh, cockpit and your body. You can see your body is being covered in ice, and everything starts to go black, and you can hear your players taking their very last breath. It's super, super intense but incredibly effective. And it's 100, more effective, 100 times more effective than having like, game over, try again on your screen. Uh, there's been a few other virtual reality things, games I can think of <laughs> that are dealing with death. Uh, this game is Disunion Guillotine Simulator, which simulates being beheaded by a guillotine. <laughs> there's also a game called Suicide Simulator, which simulates jumping off of a building. I don't think you can die, you just can keep doing that, and it's really terrifying. Um, I haven't actually found a ton of, of games that do really cool things with VR and death, so if you can think of anything, please tell me. Um, but that's exactly it. I'm, I'm looking forward to the future of death in virtual, virtual reality, in seeing how people innovate and use it in interesting ways. So I'm going to end my talk with a challenge to you as independent developers at Indicate East. And my challenge to you, regardless of what type of game you're developing, what kind of developer you are, what platform you're developing for, is to just truly think about death and how it best fits with your game design. Uh, this may mean that you stick with a traditional death mechanic, and that's super OK. That's totally fine. And the important thing is that we're actually thinking about death in our games and giving players the opportunity to think about death and potentially come to terms with their own mortalities. So on that note, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>